And here we go again after a small break from the snow yesterday. We're in for more snow tonight. We're already seeing some light flurries here around <laughs> Spokane. Thanks for joining us. First at four, I'm Jane McCarthy. And I'm Tom Sherry. Here we go again talking about weather. Maybe not getting as much snow in the Spokane area, but certainly to the south and to the east of us, we think we're going to see plenty of snow. We have a winter weather advisory until 4 a.m., two to five inches of snow, where that winter uh, storm warning is, or excuse me, where the uh, winter weather advisory is everything that is shaded in yellow. You've got that winter storm warning in effect, and that's mostly to the south of us and to the east of us. That is until 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Could see 6 to 10 inches of snow fall in some of those areas. Here in the Spokane area uh, and south of us, I think we'll be in the 1 to 3 inch range, possibly even the 2 to 4 inch range. Let me spell it out for you a little bit better. Uh, 1 to 3 expected in Spokane and Deer Park. Less snow in Colville, uh, maybe 1 to 2 inches out towards Ritzville, but the far the farther west you go, the less snow you're going to see. And I know you folks out there in the Yakima area, uh, Moses Lake area, Wenatchee, Chelan, you got hammered last time. Well, mm -hmm. that will not be the story this time. But folks to the south of us, four to eight inches of snow in Pullman and Moscow, three to four inches of snow down towards the Tico area. And we'll look for up to four inches of snow over in the Silver Valley, depending on the, the location. You can see already heavy snow that is falling down in the uh, lower Columbia Basin around the Tri-Cities and just east of the Tri-Cities over towards Walla Walla. Rain on the west side of the state until we get to the Cascades. There we'll see a foot of snow falling in that location. Only light snow falling, most of it from the Spokane Valley east out towards the Rathdrum Prairie, up towards Coeur d'Alene, and then farther north up towards the Spirit Lake area. So uh, we're looking for an overnight low of 19 degrees with that light snowfall. Lingering snow tomorrow in Spokane. Not so much, though, to the south of us. It will do more than linger. It will continue to fall south of Spokane down in the Washington and Idaho Palouse. And then for the weekend, I've got more snow on Saturday, lingering on Sunday. Daytime highs 32 both Saturday and Sunday. I'll run that future tracker computer model for you coming up in just a couple of minutes. Looking forward to that. For now, we want to get a quick check of the rose. Meteorologist Thomas Patrick is out in the mobile storm tracker right now. And Thomas, how is it looking out there right now? Hey there, Jane. Yeah, we've seen a couple snowflakes, just some flurries, if you will, down in the South Hill in Spokane so far. That isn't really accumulating, and all the major roads are faring just fine. But what we are noticing is that uh, we are still feeling the effects of the previous two weeks of snow. Almost two feet of, sn of snow has fallen in the last two weeks here in Spokane. And what you're seeing off of 57th Avenue is that these residential roads, yeah, they've been plowed, but unfortunately, a couple of those days where we did get just above freezing, the water was uh, still on the roads, it refroze, and then we repeated that cycle. So this is all just super icy on the residential areas as we take a turn on 53rd Avenue. So getting from one of these streets back to the major roads will still be a little bit slippery, but at least the interstates and arterials are doing just fine, at least at the moment. But we will keep an eye on things as the snow continues to fall throughout the rest of this evening. Live from the mobile storm tracker in Spokane, a meteorologist Thomas Patrick. Back to you. Thanks for the look, Thomas. Yeah. All right, the city of Spokane asked for your thoughts on parking last spring. So over the last year, consultants worked on a parking study of the downtown mm -hmm. core and then also the university district. Prem 2's Amanda Rowley explains what changes the consultants suggest will improve parking in Spokane. The city of Spokane has 37,000 parking spaces in downtown. 85% are off street in a lot or structure, while 15% are on street spaces. Private consultants hired by the city published the 2019 downtown parking study plan. It looks at updating the city's policies and parking management, reducing demand, and making spots simple to find and use. But adjustments to on-street regulations are what could affect drivers the most. First off, existing regulations. Right now, the plan recommends converting two-hour spaces to four-hour spaces in the areas highlighted in pink. This includes between 2nd and 4th Avenues, west of Monroe Street and south of Riverside Avenue. Then, all-day meter spaces would be converted to four-hour spaces. This would apply to these areas highlighted in blue. And finally, add an extra hour to all existing three-hour spaces, making them four-hour spots. 
The plan also suggests setting a minimum and maximum parking rate and implementing a new on-street rate structure using premium and value zones. Analysts also point out existing citation rates are too low. For example, an expired meter has a penalty of just $15, but all-day parking costs $13.20 at the two-hour meters. So there's not much incentive to actually pay the meter. As a result, they suggest increasing parking ticket penalties to $30. Now, to be clear, the final plan is only a proposal that still needs to be approved by the city council. There will be discussions leading up to the final decision. The 2019 Downtown Parking Study Plan will be presented to the public next week. In the meantime, you can visit the plan on the city's website. Amanda Rowley, CREM2 News. In other news, the man accused of killing a missing Colorado mother is in court today. The prosecution is making its case to try Patrick Frazee with his fiance Kelsey Barreth's murder. Barreth was last seen on Thanksgiving Day. So today in court, authorities say they found evidence of Barreth's blood spread throughout her bathroom. We learned Frazee told police the two were going their separate ways at the time of her disappearance. Police say Frazee took custody of the couple's baby the last day she was seen alive. Frazee also told police in a recorded call their custody agreement was loosely defined. Her body has not been found, but authorities believe she is no longer alive. Now, a nurse from Idaho, Crystal Kennedy, already pleaded guilty to tampering with Barris' cell phone following her disappearance. We learned today Kenny, Kenny was in Colorado around the same time Barreth went missing. She admitted to a romantic relationship with Frazee. She says Frazee once even asked her to poison a drink and give it to Barreth. As part of her plea deal, Kenny agreed to testify at Frazee's trial. Frazee is charged with two counts of first degree murder. For updates on this case, you can always check creme.com. Well, ice dams in your gutter and icicles hanging from your roof, they can be damaging and are something that comes with living in the cold, wet weather of our winter season. Krem 2's Mark Hanrahan joins us with a story now you can see tonight at 5 o'clock. Mark? Yes, good afternoon, guys. These are things that just happen when we start to get a melt, which happened last week, and it gets cold again like this week. So what should we do about all those icicles or ice dams building up on the side of our homes? Well, for a story coming up new on Krem 2 News at 5 tonight, we talked to a local roofing expert. He has some tips on how to safely remove them. Also, what not to do if your gutters are filled with solid ice. It's when you start trying to remove that ice, you could end up in trouble. So again, we'll have more on this story coming up on Creme 2 News at 5 tonight. Back to you guys. Looking forward to that, Mark. Thank you. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders has thrown his hat into the ring now for president. Joining a crowded Democratic field, Whitney Ward joins us now with the latest. Whitney? Good afternoon. Yes, so the independent senator from Vermont says his 2020 campaign for president will be a continuation of his 2016 run. So when he mounted a significant challenge to the Democratic establishment, it was successful in a lot of ways. Sanders becomes the 10th candidate now officially vying for that Democratic nomination following Senators Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren. They've all launched their campaigns already. In an interview with CBS, the 77 year old progressive and self proclaimed Democratic Socialist says he's OK if people call him a radical. In 2016, many of the ideas that I talked about, all of those ideas and many more are now part of the political mainstream. Now, Sanders says he considers many of his competitors here in the Senate as friends, but it remains to be seen whether he can stand out in such a crowded field of candidates. If he does win, Bernie Sanders would be the oldest elected president. It means he would be 79 when he took office, so we'll certainly keep an eye on that. Jane, Tom, back to you. Hmm. Whitney, thank you. In other news, lawsuits have now been filed to stop President Donald Trump from implementing a national emergency declaration. Of course, the one to get a wall built along the U.S.-Mexican border. And now 16 states have filed a lawsuit challenging President Trump's plan to build that border wall without the approval of Congress. One lawsuit calls the president's decision to declare a national emergency unlawful and unconstitutional. President Trump tweeted this morning that he predicted the lawsuits and said they were being mostly led by, quote, open border Democrats and the radical left. It violates the appropriations clause within Article I of the Constitution, which grants Congress the power to appropriate taxpayer dollars. They will sue us in the Ninth Circuit, uh, even though it shouldn't be there. 
and we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake, and we'll win in the Supreme Court. Well, a new poll from NPR finds a majority of Americans surveyed disapprove of the national emergency declaration. The numbers do fall largely along party lines with independents breaking against the president's decision.